as chief curator, you know, I worked with another curator, David Chino Villarente, to put together all the work that you see in the show from rare spray paint collections to paintings that people haven't seen since the 80s up through contemporary stuff created more recently. As animals, we want to mark our terrain. Um, but what we understand today, or what people, some people call graffiti, is a language that was born here and in the streets of Philadelphia, and it's now a global language with many regional dialects. So it made pretty obvious sense to us to start with what was happening here in New York and then branch off. I hope people come to the Rite of Passage exhibition and walk away with the sense of understanding that it's more than just scribble scrabble that we're seeing on the walls. It's not, you know, uh, the markings of territorial gang members, you know, it's the markings of, you know, folks who are part of a history and a lineage and a language that goes back many years. And it's a language that people around the world have picked up and have added their own, you know, uh, dialogue and their own words to it. And it's something that so many young people around the world have connected with and related to and is now part of their lives. And it's something that's not going away. You know, here in America, um, Americans have been, the American establishment has been really slow to embrace, you know, this language that was created here. But I think the challenge has always been economics. You know, people don't necessarily love America around the world, but they love American culture. The world loves hip hop and rock and roll and jazz and the blues. And all these forms of expression that were created here, there's a way to monetize it. And I think. Because, you know, quote unquote graffiti is a language that's intimidating that people don't understand and ultimately people haven't been able to find a way to make money from it. It's kind of this thing that, you know, America has been slow to embrace, but the world has embraced it. Well, we wanted to tell um, a, a story that was as broad as possible and I think that um, the people that we were able to work with were, you know, many of them were people we had relationships with, but myself and the co-curator have you know, produce many books on the subject and know a lot of people over the years of being in New York City and being a part of the culture. But we just wanted to do something that was broad enough uh, that would pull in more interest from folks who are not at all initiated, you know, or familiar with the culture, while also serving the culture in a way that people would appreciate. For instance, you know, we have a display case filled with spray paint. Well, you know, uh, what does that mean? Well, to people in the culture, this vintage spray paint means a whole lot. But in that same display case, we have a can of oven cleaner. But what does oven cleaner have to do with anything? Well, kids would take the nozzles off the oven cleaner cans and put them on spray cans to regulate the width of the spray. You know, painters have different sized brushes. So did graffiti writers. And they were working with the tools of the trade that were available to them at a time when there weren't you know, all these spray paint brands created by folks inside of the culture who understand, well, we need to make a few different kinds of caps to regulate the size, you know. So now things have changed greatly. So we are displaying things like that that give you a real window into the ingenuity and the creativity of the young people who, you know, started the stuff in the late 70s, or excuse me, who started all this in the early 70s. Well, you know, this project was discussed as far back as five or six years ago and you know about a year ago I got a call from our friends at Red Bull saying that they were interested in reviving it and here we are today.